This is the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. If you're a hardcore angler, you've come to the right place. This is a weekly podcast that will interview some of the top smallmouth bass anglers in North America. Travis and his guest will discuss what it takes to consistently catch big smallmouth, and you'll get a glimpse inside the mind of a trophy smallmouth angler. And now, here's your host of the Small Mouth Crush Podcast, Travis Manson. Hello, welcome to the Smallmouth Crush Podcast. My name is Travis Manson. Another amazing week talking with some of the top smallmouth bass anglers in North America. And today's show is very special. Another Canadian. I don't know what it is about these Canadians. They can catch some big smallmouth. We've had a lot of Canadians, no doubt. There's some big fish that live up there. If I was a Canadian, that's what I'd be doing. I'd be chasing big smallmouth nonstop at some of those awesome, amazing fisheries. Of course, you got a handful of Great Lakes that border Canada, Simcoe, probably thousands of inland lakes there's lakes i don't even know about lake of the woods i don't know we gotta we gotta get gussie back on talk about some of that stuff but uh today's guest is uh knows how to put some big bass in the boat i think you guys are going to really appreciate the information that we're going to go over tonight but before we go there let's talk about the real shot of course they have the most wanted bass tackle that a smallmouth crush fan could want top brands like mega bass jackal evergreen z-man Daiwa. And of course, they got staple brands like VMC, Rapala, Berkeley. It's all there. One stop shopping, same day delivery. And they're going to help you uh, fill up your tackle box for your next tournament or big bass fishing adventure. Of course, if you use the code SmallmouthCrush15, you're going to get 15% off your first order. So definitely want to head on over to therealshot.com and let them know Smallmouth Crush sent you let's get into it i'm ready another awesome week talking smallmouth bob azumi what's going on not much man i'm just uh, waiting to get out on the water i, I uh, hear you absolutely ready to rock them and uh you know what a smallmouth fishing done a little bit of it over the years you, you know, have. I know that you're a fanatical smallmouth fisherman by the way i must say um I, I admire the fact that you guide for a living, you know, mm. in, you know, Chesapeake Bay and some of the other lakes and then yep. on the Thousand Islands and Lake Ontario, because I know a lot of guides. I've been in this business for 42 years and I'll tell you, folks that don't know what you go through putting clients on fish, it's a different way to make a living but it's also got its stress, its ups and downs. And just when, you know, you know, you, you want to get some clients on fish, you'll find out, gee, they don't know how to use a rod and reel. <laughs> <laughs> and you're on the best bite in, in the world right now. You know? <laughs> yes. You got to be prepared. You know what I mean? Uh, fortunately, I haven't run into too much of that, but I certainly know what you mean, especially when we get into some largemouth fisheries and you need to throw a uh, chatterbait and maybe rip it through grass and you might have a client that's not used to really throwing a bait caster, we got to resort to ripping chatter baits with spinning rods, which can be a challenge. So we right try on. to uh, we try to do the best we can to get those clients on fish. But I tell you what, it's uh, a little bit easier up on Lake Ontario and some of these smallmouth fisheries when you get around these fish. Uh, I definitely want to pick your brain, you know, Bob, what, you know, what makes you such a great angler successful and, and the, you know, the fact that you can stay consistent and put some of these big smallmouth in the boat. But before we go there, uh, you know, just for some viewers and listeners that may not be too familiar with yourself, Bob, can you give us a little bit of background uh, on you and, and kind of what your, what your plans here are in the future as well? Yeah, the, the, I'll try to make it real short because, mm -hmm. you know, I can get going on and on about anything <laughs> pretty much. I mean, I love to talk, but, but this is my 42nd year fishing for a living in Canada when I was 20 years old. I, I became Canada's first full-time angler. And I, at that time, I was working in a factory. I was temporarily laid off. And I'd heard at that time Mercury Marine. Um, I brought my Mercury uh, cup just for you. My, right, uh, right. Up tonight, full of Diet Coke. So, uh, by the way, that stuff doesn't work, as you can see. I got all this extra <laughs> winter weight. But anyway, um, Mercury, we're looking for a guy to do seminars at the Toronto International Boat Show. 10-day show, biggest show in Canada. And I had caught wind from a tournament organizer. So back then, my dad was still alive. He passed away, gosh, about a year after I started in the business. So when I was around 21, 22, he passed away. But him and I drove up to Mercury headquarters in Mississauga met with the marketing manager who actually I just spoke to the other day. He's in his eighties now and, and long since retired, but he, he was there for like 40 years, Bob Patterson. 
and uh, said hi to him. And get this, he uh, um, he was the first guy to hire me at twenty five dollars a day to do seminars for ten days because they couldn't get Al Linner, who I became oh, friends with. Uh huh. During that era, around 80, 81, I went to go meet Al in Buffalo when he was doing seminars. And I, I said to him, you know, what I was doing and that, and then went to another meeting with him in 83, uh, just before in 82 and said in 83, we're thinking about starting a TV show, which we started in 83. And I think we're like, you know, 37 or 38 years or whatever doing it now. Um, and uh, that's the short story. So seminars for $25 a day was my first gig. Uh, picked up four or five sponsors at that show that saw what I was doing. And uh, and they came on board just ironically because, you know, there was nobody doing fishing seminars uh, in that era. I mean, in, in 1980 in Canada, it was rare to do. You, you might see like uh, Spence Petros uh, from Fishing Facts or Al Linder maybe come into Canada on a rare occasion to do a seminar, but that was it. So mm. Al was not available and I got my first, uh, you know, kick at the cat and here I am yeah. 42 years later. And, and Al sure. actually was our first and not our first, he, the first year we went to the TV show, the real fishing show in 83, uh, him and Ron uh, liked what we were doing. And, you know, we were big in fishermen fans of the time of their magazine. And they said, let's do a 60 second ad. You guys produce the ad and we'll split the revenue of that ad for in fisherman subscriptions into Canada. And mm -hmm. that year, our first year on TV, uh, even though we had Mercury and other sponsors, um, you know, for small packages, because it was the first year we had started and we were only Ontario only before we went national. And on 13 stations, we ran that ad. We got so many subscriptions that it turned out that half the money went to the lenders, half to us to offset costs. And it was our biggest sponsor that year. We sold like a ton of wow. subscriptions and that was kind of a neat deal, you know, that yeah. the little sort of helped me uh, while well, they did help us in our initial TV year. And the only reason I started that TV show, and this is not, uh, not a lie, is I was starving but loving it as a single guy fishing tournaments at the time. And I'd fished them since I was 15 years old. My dad started and organized the first bass tournament in Canada on Rondo Bay on Lake Erie mm. when I was 15 years old. And that got me friggin' hooked, man. I was like, this is neat. I like the highs and lows of this tournament. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Highs are so fun, as you know, than the lows, but, yeah. um, but it's all part and parcel, right? And, yeah. and that got me hooked on tournaments. So I'd started fishing these tournaments like a madman. And then when those seminars come, come by, I had already been fishing lots of tournaments. Um, and so that's what I did is I did like a, a show with a rear screen projection with slides and I sat in a boat or not sat, but stood in a boat fishing rod as a pointer and talked to the crowd. And, and that was, you know, that was in those early days. And, uh, here I am now talking to you on a podcast and that's where technology has gone, man. Everything is sure. you know instant. It's now. And you got, you get the current events out pretty quick, uh, you know, through a podcast where, you know, we, you know, for the TV show tape a year in advance. So it's old hat by time we'd say. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the fast sort of track story. <laughs> wow. I'm sure. Yeah. You've got, I can just tell we could talk hours and hours about this. So, you know, the seminars, when you first started, this is probably before they even had, you know, that little fish tank, right? Where you'd go up there and talk about baits. Uh, that probably hadn't come around for even even a few more years after that. No, it came in the late 80s. Actually, I helped design one that they spent probably a hundred grand or eighty grand on up here to get made with you know big thick glass and everything. Sure. And they did it, um, copied the one that was in the US, the original uh trough or whatever fish trough, I think they called it. And that was the original one. And and I, I had had the guys from the Canadian National Sports Shows, actually. They flew down the States, seen one of the seminars, took all the measurements of the tank, brought it up and had a fabricator make that thing up here. And and that was the first tank. That was that was actually about mid-80s. That was around mm -hmm. a couple, about 85, maybe 84, they made that tank. Um, and, uh, you know, it, the funny thing is, 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 is I know you're a tournament fanatic. I've seen some of your videos where you know mm -hmm. you're, you're at the tournaments, and I can just tell you got you got the addiction as much as most of us uh, bass heads have it. Uh, um, it's I think drugs would have been cheaper, uh, uh. But, 
I heard how much tackle you buy. Uh, we right. need to do a contest, but you beat me on certain products, I think, already. <laughs> well, but, yeah. You know, and, and for me, just like what we were talking earlier, for, for people that, that are now where, you know, we were talking about our addiction to tackle and kind of how, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to keep things more simple now, to be honest well, with you. Uh, that's my new goal. That. I keep saying that, uh -huh. uh, Travis, but let's face it. It's just when you keep it simple, you go into a tournament that you know could be one, not on the Thousand Islands or Lake Ontario, but you know somewhere else where it could be one on smallmouth or largemouth. And now all of a sudden it's not simple anymore because, you know, you've got everything from, you know, chatter baits to, to, to different types of crank baits and drop shots and flipping, pitching, everything. And now all of a sudden it gets back to, even though you, you can streamline and I've been thinking how to streamline and I've been watching a lot of these guys, you know, all the different touring pros and you see their man caves, you see how they pack their trucks and nobody has simplified it yet though. Mm -hmm. Still because even, even almost all the pros for the most part pack a ton of tackle, right? Mm -hmm. Like no way around it. And even for you, for, if you're not fishing turn, I'm sure for your guiding, it's crazy, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I would say that that uh, the biggest thing is is uh, is confidence baits. Pack those first. That's what I'm starting to do. Is pack all my confidence baits, a minimum of three bags of every color in the boat. Then I mm -hmm. I, I take about six more bags of all the confidence baits in the truck for every mm -hmm. road trip I do, mm -hmm. and then I pack all the fringe stuff in boxes. Um, accordingly, but the, the hard thing is, is, you know, like, let's say we're going over the Mississippi river and there's, um, you know, uh, uh, an open over there or something. Um, and I haven't fished the tournament there now for probably half a dozen years, but I love that place. That's a place there where, you know, you need a little bit of everything, right? Cause yeah. you fishing, you know, crankbaits around wing dams or, or you might be, you know, uh, throwing a frog or flipping or pitching or or whatever, right? So mm -hmm. there's not much you can't uh, you can't really do wrong on anything there. So I don't know. I I love buying tackle. It's it's an addiction. I I was working on some orders earlier today, and and uh, you know the biggest thing with this whole COVID deal is, and I mentioned this to you before the show is, for all the uh, you know all the viewers and listeners out there is, I recommend if there's something you want for this season. Um, you know, spring, summer, fall, whatever, is if you see it in your tackle store, or now that I heard about that website that you're working mm, with, sure, I'm going there and using my crush uh, code, on right, that. right, I gotta buy some stuff. What's the name of that company? So it's the real shot. It's a uh, tackle store in Wisconsin. Um, that they actually, man, they've been around for quite a while now, and they're actually doing the uh, media for the uh, the new national uh bass tour that's out there so they're doing all the the social media and the live for that they also do uh kind of a fairly new platform when it comes to tournament fishing they do it both in walleye and bass it's called head to head fishing and so that's kind of a, a cool concept that was developed in in that wisconsin region uh um, by these guys he was a high school uh friend of mine so um, I, very I cool love place. that Wisconsin fishing now. Mm. Uh, Derek Strube and I go to that um, Sturgeon Bay Open for yeah. about the last 10 years. And I think we've cashed a check maybe in about seven of the 10 or so. But first year we go to that thing, we had heard different stories. And I talked to guys like Steve Clapper, who fished with uh, Van Dam's brother there one year. And Steve said, oh, man, we didn't do good. We tried finding them deep and we couldn't. And mm -hmm. I talked to a number of guys, all the Gussie and the crew from Northwest Ontario. And they said, oh, it's it's a different fishery. And so we go there not expecting much. And and Gussie and all those guys were all rooming in the hotel beside us. And and uh, uh, some now I'd you know, known about the Marabou jig, but I didn't know it was such a player there at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, they threw us a handful, and Strube and I ended up winning like nine grand. and got third on our first year there. We're oh, going wow. oh, this place is easy, you know. And 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 did we get our rear end kicked the next uh, bunch of years? I mean, sure. we never got, you know, we never got to finish like third since. But we've had some good finishes, but not not third. And and it was funny because even Ted Takasaki, the walleye pro, 
he sends me a text after we got third and, and one of the other walleye pros that was fishing that same tour, uh, a renowned pro, I can't think of his name off him, but he was, he was beside us fishing. And every time we'd stroll by him with, with these hair jigs, we'd be, you know, unhooking another five pounder, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and finally after the turn tack sack, he texts me out of the blue and, and I know Ted and he says, Hey, uh, just wondering what were you guys using? <laughs> a friend of mine was just wondering. And I'm right. like, uh, yeah, just a finesse jig. <laughs> it was it was pretty funny, but um, yeah, that was uh, just when you know hair was uh, kept pretty secretive. Yeah, I'd like to guess. Uh, I'd like to guess that year. Um, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say oh six oh seven. It might have been. Yeah, yeah might somewhere have been. around there because it, for a little while that hair jig really was uh, a secret, like. I remember because this was right when I first really started converting from walleye fishing to bass fishing and spending some more time up there in Sturgeon Bay and the Bay of Green Bay. And I remember when the Canadians would come to town, you would see them throwing some super small bait that you, you couldn't get a visual on it and you, they would just whack these fish. And it wasn't until for me about 07 when I got word of what it was, shared it with a couple of my buddies, and we had the best two years of smallmouth fishing you can imagine on that hair jig. It, 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 was, it was an amazing deal. And that's actually kind of a neat segue into how smallmouth be, be, can become a, a condition to bait. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, let's face it, when, when that bite happens or when it was happening and it still does but nothing like you can throw that thing um you know in all some of the best smallmouth fisheries in the world and there are times that they should eat it and they're not and mm -hmm. which would indicate that they've you know become accustomed to it or have seen it um and we've seen that with tubes and all kinds of things i guess we haven't seen it yet on the drop shot but um, you know the days of dropping a tube on Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, Saint Clair. You mark a fish. You, dread, you all you have to do is drop a tube, half ounce, three eighths ounce, whatever you got tied on. Mm -hmm. Get it down to the fish, and all of a sudden it thump. And and those days don't happen near as much as they used to, unless right. there's an incredible bite going on and the fish are just in a feeding frenzy and and you know that maybe the the moon's lining up or the soul in their tables are right or whatever that is is just um you know i've seen it where it's magical as you have where you can't do anything wrong and even in shallow smallmouth they'll be chasing any bait you throw you'll be reeling it real fast to get another cast and all of a sudden a big black one comes out of nowhere chasing it from 20 30 feet away and mm -hmm. they'll chase it like a like a tuna to the boat you know and I'll, i've had them come out of the water after Ned rigs and tubes and spy baits before, right at the boat in practice, like at the Thousand Islands. And sure. Once the tournament rolls around, they'll freaking fish get the memo, right? right. They're not, they, they don't like doing that during the tournament. But, but then how many times have you been out there and you know the fish are there, you're seeing them on your electronics, or you're seeing them visually clear water, and they don't react to mm -hmm. the techniques that you are sitting with, you know, you've got everything, right? It seems a lot more often than not lately. I know. I, I, you know, and I wonder if it's the amount of gobies too. Like, is it that they're pigging out on gobies so much that the food base is there where they just, it's like, you know, it's like a, it's like a person that, that lives, you know, beside a, uh, a buffet restaurant and, you know, sure. and they're, very big person and they're so used to going into that and just you know getting their money's worth like me for instance and and you know they can't move to get baits i don't know i i don't know what it is you know no, i think that's a good point i've often thought of that myself you know just the fact that there is so many gobies down there you drop a camera down in any of the great lakes and in certain areas it's covered by it uh right. you know one of the techniques that i try to do is is of course I want to match the hatch meaning I want to have a bait that's similar in color, but sometimes I like to, uh, and that's why I think one of the techniques that I utilize a lot is, is having a, a drop shot rig. That's a little bit longer with a leader at times. I think it allows you to maybe stand out from the crowd, if you will, um, when it right. comes to trying to get those extra bites. But I mean, that's what we love about fishing. It's, it's always something different. There's always new challenges. Every year is different. You know, yourself, 
you can you can wreck them for one year on an area and for the next two years there's never a fish that comes back into that zone uh, isn't that crazy yeah i i often wonder you know and i and i've thought about that a lot because being a tournament fanatic is you often wonder if you know you're moving fish um from an area in tournaments that is and are they making their way back now that dr bruce tufts the uh fisheries biologist in kingston has had a lot of funding and a lot a, a big team doing studies on tournament caught and released bass over the years uh. and uh i'll give you an example though that that's kind of funny is is i caught a tag fish in one tournament and this tournament was out of brockville which you know way mm -hmm. way down the river and I was way out in the lake and I caught this fish and I weighed it and it weighed like five one. And I didn't need it because we had like, uh, in that term, we, we had a big weight. It was, they were on bed. So it was like easy fishing. And so I released it back on the bed and, uh, and uh, you know, I think our biggest fish was an ounce or, I mean, our smallest fish was an ounce or two bigger. So, so anyway, um, put it back. So three or four weeks later, I believe it was four weeks later, it was, another tournament, Canadian Open out of uh, Kingston. I go back to that same area. That fish now has moved to another bed about 30, 40 yards away. Tagged fish. I see the tag in the clear water. And my son and I needed that fish at the time. Um, in fact, uh, you know, because now it's a month later and they're not all, you know, big fatties on beds. Uh, these were just a few of the last ones still on. Uh -huh. Caught it, same fish, same markings. And it had lost eight ounces in four weeks of being on different beds. Now, wow. it, very promiscuous fish because it was on uh -huh. like another bed now. Sure. Right. So, it, it, you know, this male had guarded one bed and then moved to another bed um, uh, a month later or sometime in between. And, uh, it, but that fish was about 40 miles from Kingston. Mm -hmm. Tells mm -hmm. you how far that fish, so somebody caught it the first, before I caught it, so the year before, weighed it. It went back to that area. I caught it again in a tournament out of Brockville. I weighed it, released it back on the bed, came back a month later and caught that same fish, brought it back to Kingston again. Wow. You're talking about a fish that is well traveled in bass boats, mm -hmm. yet found its way back. Now they had other tag fish that they found downriver 30 to 40 or 50 miles downriver that were caught and weighed in in Kingston and had made their way back and recaptured again and weighed in and turned to the again. same area, same area. Wow. So you're talking about fish that have been caught in Kingston, made their way back after they've been released and then back by boat weighed in again. And I think, you know, for the most part, probably wanted to get back home base again. So it it's amazing to think that their senses will do that in certain cases. Now, we have fished tournaments in Belleville in the Bay of Quinney, um, which uh, you probably haven't fished too much because it's mm -mm. a little bit more into Ontario and it's mm -hmm. a pretty good boat ride if you're if you're on uh, the U.S. side. But we fished a lot of tournaments in Bay of Quinney, and we've caught big smallmouth the next day right in the weeds after there's been some fish from the lake brought in. We've caught them on largemouth baits in you know some of the largemouth weeds, and they're big fat pot belly fish, and they don't live there for sure. They don't, but right. they're in eight feet of water in the weeds and that. So we've caught, you know, retreads doing that. But um, in the case of, you know, and that's why now in like a lot of the Quinny tournaments and that, they don't allow you to fish the lake for smallmouth now. They won't let you weigh in smallmouth from past Glenora Ferry, which is, you know, at the entrance of Lake Ontario, just sure. within sort of Amherst there. So you can't go past there. So it kind of cuts out all those big lake smallmouth being brought, you know, 50, 60, 70 miles back in mm -hmm. the belleville or some of the tournaments mm -hmm. but you know and that's a good thing it, it it's it's a bummer though because i i won a lot of tournaments down there by running out in the lake or even to the saint lawrence and then running back weighing in fish sure uh, derek strube and i we won two quinny classics uh back to back by by running uh, the big water one year we ran all the way to the saint lawrence and the winds blowing out of the west i mean hard uh-huh and we get out on Lake Ontario and we got to cross to get to the St. Lawrence on, on the Cape Vincent side. And, and, uh, and we got one, uh, we got a six something and then a limit of 25 pounds that day. And, 
and got big fish for the two day tournament and then ended up next day. We went all the way back mm -hmm. to the St. Lawrence and it's an east wind. And those damn fish turned off. Like we were doing our best, uh, you know, strip uh, that we were drifting where we caught a six and some other big fish the first day and had a limit real quick. We don't get a fish, nothing mm. in about an hour and a half, uh, maybe three drifts. And so he says, okay, time to pull the chute. I think we went out and we caught, uh, I don't know, maybe four, uh, maybe 21 pounds or something that day and, and ended up winning the tournament. And then the next year, the fish weren't there. So we fished the lake. And in the first day, if you can believe it, we get 26 pounds and change, a six something, win big fish for the tournament. Sure. The turn, then we weighed in the exact same weight within about a half a pound is what we did the year before. And we ended up winning with the with oh, yeah. half a pound each year, the same sort of days, a 25 pound day and a 21 pound day or something like that, you know, but that's where, you know, you got to be versatile in these smallmouth as you know, and I, man, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in your boat. All those days you spend guiding on the thousand mm. islands of Lake Ontario, because day in, day out, you're seeing the movement of these fish here today, gone tomorrow, up right. higher, down lower. I mean, I'd love to see um, some of the stuff you've learned out there. It, it must be amazing uh, when you're out there and you got to put your clients on fish that, you know, I'm sure you've gone to some of your surefire spots and been disappointed. Sure. Yep. And then all of a sudden, it's that fringe area. You, you, you load the boat and you go, wow, I never would have did this if it wasn't such a crappy day and fish this little mm -hmm. area down further up, further out, further whatever, right? Yeah, you're exactly right. It's always a, it's always a challenge. You know, Bob, are you more of a, a shallow water? So when we're talking clear water smallmouth, especially in the Great Lakes and in, you know, the St. Lawrence River and a lot of, a lot of bodies of water that have clear water, uh, there's opportunities to chase smallmouth super shallow, uh, you know, sight fish for cruisers. Uh, versus the deep fish, what do you think you're, I guess, what's, what's the way you love to catch them? And then what's maybe a strength? Do you, do you, do you prefer, uh, you know, if, if you're going into a tournament, do you ever go up shallow or vice versa? Yeah, I, I prefer shallow and you, do. you know, the weird thing is this picture behind me is a big old largemouth that mm -hmm. an artist did, uh, for me years ago. I, I like largemouth fishing a little bit better than smallmouth because that's what I cut my teeth on. But we fish both smallmouth, largemouth on Lake Erie at Rondo Bay where I grew up fishing, where my dad held that first bass tournament many moons ago. So um, in smallmouth, I love big, shallow smallmouth, even in August or whatever. But I will say, and I used to think I was a really good sight fisherman, and this is where you get humbled. Until I've watched kids like Corey and Chris Johnson come in the areas, do laps around you in the shallow water and stroke big fish after big fish, leave and you're 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 sitting there or stand there with your head spinning, hmm. going, How did they just do that? And now they're on their way and they just took three, you know, four and a half to five and a half pound fish out of the area you've been fishing, and you know, you still haven't got a limit and they're they're calling, you know. Yeah. And, What's amazing is like shallow water fishing for me is I do like to figure out what the fish are doing. Um, when you get good anglers like that, that got six or 10 rods on their deck, like I do for just sight fishing and they're switching around back forth, this, that, and they're not afraid to even chase fish for like 50 or a hundred yards mm -hmm. and they catch them. Like that's pretty, that's pretty yeah. neat. That fish is spooked. And they're following it and they keep casting and casting and that and trying to figure out how to get that thing to, to you know go down on the bait and suck it in and and that so been a bit humbled over the last bunch of years because i'm not as you know not as young as i used to be but i also i just think that you know it is truly a hunting game if you target shallow fish and it's if it's stealth like but it's also reading the mood of the fish Mm -hmm. and changing it up all the time with different presentations and, and ways you're trying to trigger that fish into eating, whether you're, you know, you're watching it and it's going, you know, uh, left or right. And, and you, you know, you go, okay, I'm going to throw now eight feet past it and bring the bait in and dead stick it. Now see if it'll come to it, you know, and mm -hmm. you're trying to figure out all these little things if they're tough to catch, because sometimes, you know, you got to knock it on the head and have it sitting almost like it's on a bed, even if it isn't. And get it right in front of its lips where it just opens its mouth, sucks it in, 
yeah. and eats it, even though it's not doing anything, right? And mm -hmm. and, that, and then other times when they're cruising, you got to decide how far you're going to lead them. And I love that. But, you know, that Everstart tournament that I won um, on the Thousand Islands out of Clayton, that was all deep. You know, sure. that was deep fishing. Um, and then the next year I got second in that. That was all deep. And, I, you know, it, it's kind of funny. That you know it from guiding, so you'll know, you know where I'm at here. But I, I do it more because of in Canada having the TV show for so long and stuff that I don't want to be a bad guy to my co-angler, right? I want them to catch fish. So I drew sure. this guy who was a live bait guide from Clayton the one day, the next year after I'd won it. Uh -huh. I forget what day of the tournament it was, but anyway, he said to me, he said, you know, Bob, I just want to come in with a limit. Last year I fished this and as a co-angler, I didn't weigh a limit in there. And, and all my friends and family are at the way and they're all laughing, saying, mm -hmm. well, you guide here, man. <laughs> so in my mind, I said, I'm going to make sure he gets a limit. Sure. So it's flat out there on the lake. I mean, it is flat as a pancake and we're fishing and, uh, he's not catching them and and uh he's got like one or two in the boat um you know not huge ones and i've got all fours like four four twos four ones but they're nothing no no good ones but just nice ones right mm -hmm. and and it's and it's flat and i'd already given him um one of my gulp fries to use because he didn't have any and you know he was used to some other baits and and you know just had a couple of fish so gave him a gulp fry and while I'm calling, I look at my graph, and there's like a, a spaghetti uh, piece of pasta on the graph, and we're not moving, and it's thick and got color, about a foot off bottom, 34 feet of water. And I, I said to him, I said, reel up real quick and throw up my trolling motor, and then just open your bail, let it fall. Uh -huh. So he reels up from the back of the boat, throws up there, ding, five and a half. Ah. Um, <laughs> put it in the boat. I'm calling later for like an ounce again. Mm -hmm. And I see the same thing, and I tell him, reel up, throw my trolling motor again. I see one. Four and three quarter. Jeez. So the four, the bottom line is that four and three quarter or that five and a half would have right. won that turn. I got second. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And so, you know, nice guys finished last. Sure. I, I literally well. gave away a Ranger boat that second year oh, by making sure my my uh my co-angler guide had a limit mm -hmm. but i didn't know at the time i was letting them catch two fish that were two either one would have won the tournament for wow me. and yeah. so anyway it is what it is but I, it to this day i laugh about it because uh i haven't done that since uh if i've been that close in a tournament but <laughs> right right but anyway you know it is what it is and then the, the one year when i did win i was in i think eighth place going in the final day and I, I forget what I had the last day, maybe 22 pounds or something. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll move up two or three spots, get a little bit better check. And as the guys are weighing in, and I'm I'm going, wow, they didn't beat me. They didn't beat me. They didn't beat me. Next thing you know, I win the thing. And I'm like, wow, this is pretty neat. So that one, that one's like Gussie's win on um, in Knoxville mm -hmm. recently. It's like there's Gussie wins a tournament. And, you know, when I talk to him, as he's driving home, he says, man, I didn't even know what was there. I didn't catch an 18-inch fish in practice on that drift I was doing uh, at, in, in the narrows between the two lakes there on the Tennessee River. But but I did know there was some smallmouth there because I caught like a 17-incher and a few other shorts. And and uh, doesn't he go and weigh in a limit of 18-inch plus smallmouth four days mm -hmm. in a row? Mm -hmm. and absolutely walk away with, uh, with the elite. Sure. Here. Sometimes things happen when you don't expect them, but I, I don't know. I just, uh, I love this tournament game. It's, it's, it keeps you, it keeps you humble, but it also keeps you on your toes. Cause if you don't go at it with, with everything, you're going to get all, you're going to get stomped on by these guys. Cause there's so many great anglers nowadays. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you, you get a lot of them on your, your podcast and, uh, you know, everybody's got different approaches, but at the end of the day, you can take three quarters of the field of most of these events. They're now capable of winning. Whereas it used to be about 30, 40% of the mm. field was capable of winning a tournament. Yeah. Now a lot yeah. of even our team tournaments here in Ontario um, on the renegade series and bass mania and CSFL, you know, there's two thirds to three quarters of the field are good enough to win any event, you know? Yeah.
That's and, interesting. I, I agree with that. Um, I, I don't, I haven't really thought about it too much, but it makes perfect sense. I mean, back in the day, I mean, we can just take the Chesapeake Bay and I think it's still similar, I guess, certain bodies of water. So right. for the Chesapeake, you still have your 10 or 15 guys that are always up there. Tidal water. Different. Yes. And, you know, there's some, something to be said about tidal water that if you don't know how that works, like a guy like me doesn't understand it, for instance. And and I didn't have a bad finish at the Potomac the last uh, uh, coast I fished there. I think I was the first guy out of the, the cut. But um, I don't understand tides and how they, they work on largemouth. Mm -hmm. And so I would be lost at Chesapeake just going there blind, you know, not sure. knowing how to run it. Where, But but I think on a lot of these non-fluctuating lakes and rivers, um, it's it's you know and yeah there there's still there's still regions I go into where you still have handfuls of guys you mm -hmm. know are always going to be up there, right. uh, but on on some of these lakes that are smallmouth largemouth mixed I'm finding the field has gotten to the point of it's gotten more even than it's ever been with and even at, yeah. at Surgeon Bay as an example, um, you know because at one time the hair jigging thing was a big deal there and that. There, there's always a handful of guys that are really good there, but even they can have their bad tournaments. Sure, but there's a, a yeah. whole crop of guys come up now that are having, you know, some pretty good tournaments. Not every year, but having good ones. So the field has gotten full of a lot of good anglers, you know. Mm -hmm. And when you got guys like Clapper and that that have gone there and haven't returned, and we've had some Ontario teams that haven't returned, it also tells you how tough that fishing can be there too. Sure. And, when they just don't want to bite. And I don't know why to this day, I've never heard of anybody ever doing really good uh, for the whole tournament in deep water there being that early of a tournament. It's like, where are those damn fish before they right. come up on those, those bays and flats and shorelines, you know, I've, I've looked for them. I've wasted time. I always yeah. go up shallow. Well, we That's get some what you got to do eat all the time. <laughs> <when we're lucky. laughs> right. I, yeah, I, we, yeah. we hurt that population of walleyes every time we go there because we rent a house and sure. a fish fry one of the nights. And and uh, it's hard getting eating size walleyes there because it is yeah. like a small one's like, you know, maybe four or five pounds. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, seven to ten pounders are pretty normal. And, and, and speaking of which, the last time we were there, uh, no, it was two trips ago. I think it was two tournaments back. We marked a ton of hawks outside of Big Sturgeon Bay. And we dropped down some uh, gold fin fishers, Stroob and I. And it was every drop a seven to 10 pound walleye, every oh, drop. God. And we, we caught like seven or so in a row or eight in a row. And Stroob, he's real type A, okay? He says, we got to go, we got to go. I said, man, this is too much fun, dude. Right, really? right. Yeah. 10 minutes or 15 minutes he goes no 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 let's go let's go but i convinced him to stop on the way back because we we're heading north that day to go sure. where north by one we stopped and, and we we whaled about five more quick ones just mm. before we park on our way in uh -huh. and it was like right at the mouth in the open lake you know uh outside sure. uh Stur big sturgeon bay and it was it was yeah. amazing I, I i'd love to do that again because that's the funny thing about bass fishing and tournaments is you can be, you know, you get on a good pike or walleye or musky bite and you friggin' want to leave them, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, yep. it's not good for bass fishing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always, I always uh, have to, you know, if I'm by myself, I'm different when I'm practicing. and I stay on them for a little longer. But when I'm in a team tournament with some of my, my friends that are, you know, pretty much like this, the way they approach it, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, you get a 20 pound musky on, they want to cut your line. I'm like, there's no way you're cutting my line. I'm yep. landing this fish. <laughs> uh, I've been there. I can think of many times on Lake Ontario where I'm trying to practice for a smallmouth event. Maybe I, I mark some fish. I put the camera down. It's all walleye. Well, I mean, I might want to fish a little bit before I leave, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. exactly. What would you consider, uh, you know, as far as these big tournaments, these, these, uh, you know, big water making long runs. Are you one to explore the outer limits, uh, when it comes to, you know, getting away from other anglers or what's your typical approach when you're fishing a big body, like the great lakes for an event? 
you must have, you must have been reading my mind or have a GPS uh, chip <laughs> on the boat. Uh, like for even back in the '80s. So so the neat thing is, my son and I fished a team tournament out of Trenton this year, and it was the uh, Canada Cup. So it used to be the FLW Canada Cup. This year they didn't affiliate with FLW, and uh, we won it on all largemouth, right? And um, one of the things for many, so that that tournament, by the way, being in 2020 is. Uh, Let's see. So I won my first bass tournament in 77, won another one in 79, then a pile of them in the 80s. That somewhere in between 80 and 90 tournaments I've won. And, and so in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and now 2010. So I've got six decades now. Wow. Of one so I got to just live till 2030 okay. <laughs> and win one more, and I'll get seven decades in. I don't know if that'll have happen. Uh -huh. But ever since the 80s, We've always had the reputation. My brother and Wayne and I used to fish a lot of team tournaments together. We probably won about maybe 50 together as uh, team partners. And we would run farther than anybody else. Didn't matter what lake. It didn't matter. Georgian Bay, uh, Simcoe. If we were up in Lake Kuchiching, we'd run through the Narrows and go flip largemouth down in the Holland River. And one one year we won back in 81 with uh, like 48 pounds of largemouth and, mm -hmm. and ran back and, and that. And so always done that. So even in terms of Morrisburg on the Canadian side of the St. Lawrence, there's times when I've, I've uh, with my son Darren and I fish renegade terms there, where we'll run and do a milk run out on Lake Ontario and I'm burning $450 a day in fuel. Mm. So I'm fishing about two hours and I'm fueling up either in Cape Vincent or Kingston, depending on where we decide to go out of, run around the lake and then run back to one of those ports to fuel up. So it's two fuel ups in a day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of crazy because I mean, the paybacks are decent mm -hmm. in Renegade, but you know, unless you're in the top, you know, three or five, you're losing money, you know? And so. Right. We're spending that much in fuel just chasing those fish, uh, chasing smallmouth. And so I I run as far as I can almost in, uh, I'd say, about a third of the tournaments I fish to try to get away from crowds, to try to get away from pressure. And it's never been an issue. I, I've destroyed trolling motors and boats and stuff when I was younger. Now I'm easier on them because uh, mm -hmm. I don't want guys to say, oh, I'm not buying a, a Bob Azumi boat. <laughs> sure. Rocked, right? So right. I'm easy on boats. The last probably 10 years, I've been pretty easy on them. I, I don't have screws to tighten up or anything at the end of the year. But but uh, I did cut it close. The last couple of years, I've had some tournaments where I've ran 60 or 70 miles back to weigh in through four foot waves trimmed in wide open going about 45 or 50 just you know really beating me and my team partner up like my son and we've made it back with um you know 30 seconds after the hour mm -hmm. so we can get that minute penalty we made it back a minute before away and and i'm talking about long runs yeah not letting up and getting back and 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 uh wiping my brow after going what a dumb move that was um, sure you know, after all these years, you'd think you'd learn, but how many times, especially shallow smallmouth, do they move up midday or in the afternoon mm -hmm. and your fight starts happening because it's flat or whatever and they're moved up in the area you're in and like now you're starting to get bigger ones in, in the area and you're going, this is the time to catch them. And, you know, one big fish at, at, on your last cast can make the difference between, uh, you know, a lot of places in these tournaments. So, yeah, I've run, I, I used to carry like spare electric motors uh -huh. in the rod locker back all through the 90s. Um, and I'd change it out if I broke one. Um, I don't carry a spare in, in there, but I do in my truck. I carry in the truck, two. yeah. Yeah, and and I was just telling a guy on a text today who was getting back into tournaments he used to fish them years ago. I mean, I carry stainless nuts, bolts, uh, fender washers for fixing trolling motor bolts all of that stuff in the boat uh, in containers uh, because the rough water and big water fishing, which I've cut my teeth on my whole life around the Great Lakes is it's hard on your equipment. Now I, I just finished saying five minutes ago, I'm not easy on my equipment. <laughs> I'm talking about fixing stuff, but well. I don't any screws on the boat, just, just troll the motors and stuff. <laughs> um, but, but you gotta be ready to get, get things fixed too out there when you're out there in the Absolutely. element. And so I remember in that Buffalo tournament, 
I was running a pretty good pace uh, distance. And I had to pull into shore, um, I think it was on the second day of that tournament. And uh, three or four out of the six troll motor bolts uh, we're all bent and mm -hmm. stuff. I had to pull them out with uh, with vice grips and replace those. Luckily, I had the right length of bolts, you know, three inch uh, stainless sub bolts and all the uh, locking uh, nuts and fender washers. That night, I fixed it on shore um, and got back to fishing where I could use my trolling motor on high because the mm -hmm. way it was, they were pulled out and bent and stuff. It was flexing too much. It would have broke sure. off, you know. Yep. So, um, you know, just uh, yeah, I like, uh, but I've got everything down to. Pretty much a science now. I ratchet strap my trolling motor down, mm -hmm. so stainless steel ratchet strap, and I ratchet it down so that it doesn't move at all. Um, and I make sure that the head is is obviously both you know the motor and the head are secure because the yeah. G force up there is incredible when you pound a wave, and and everything else is is secured. Like I remember back in, gosh, what was it? Late eighties. I remember in a Bassmaster invitation, I drew uh, Art Ferguson, who, who's a mm. guy you know, out of Detroit. And, and uh, one of the days in that tournament, wasn't the day I was with him, but another day in that tournament, I didn't realize in the front of my 395 uh, Ranger that I'd had my spare prop just loose in there in the, the pound. And I pounded a hole right oh, through geez. the um, yeah. apartment, you know? Yeah. Bouncing. And, and, you know, so being, you know, okay, just to say, Travis, that was late. That was in the late eighties. I was just mm -hmm. kid, and I didn't know any better. I'm much yeah. smarter. Now. Right, I got right. a foam case. This black uh, sort of, I don't know what it is, made out of a uh, uh, really neat uh, material. So it's all Velcro. Now I got a black case that's got my spare prop in yep. that's protected, so I can put that thing on my lap and it's not going to hurt anything. But but it's yeah. just uh, doesn't bang through compartments and that and. Everything is locked and loaded, and I I zip lock a spare set of clothes in a big giant zip lock in the boat in case I get soaked in these tournaments. I've got a spare set. I carry at least two, maybe three rain suits. Uh, mm -hmm. um, everything is in the boat. You know, you don't know. I mean, and when you're making runs uh, like that, that one run that we uh, do from Morrisburg round trip is about 250 miles. Hmm. and mm -hmm. you know when you're doing 250 miles in a single day a lot can happen you know and yeah. and uh, and uh so having you know fished hundreds and hundreds of tournaments in my career um you know it's and that's the only reason as i was saying earlier starting the fishing show was <laughs> to support my tournament the day. <laughs> right I started it so the reason i'm still doing it now is to support my darn sure it, is uh you got to pay for those entries and uh, expenses you know what do you think your strengths are when it comes to smallmouth fishing? Well, I I would say probably more being versatile. And, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say I'm a good shallow or a deep water angler compared to some of the guys that are really specializing in it that are really good. Mm -hmm. um, day in, day out, I think I can compete with a lot of those guys. But I think that, that you know, some of them are getting so good, you know, with this, you know, like uh, the the forward imaging type stuff, which I'm just going to get into this year yeah. uh, with Lorenz. And so I haven't had that opportunity. I'm missing the boat there, but I won't be this summer. So I think that the way a lot of these, these guys are reading their electronics now make them extremely good smallmouth anglers in deep water. I believe uh, shallow fish, you know, I mean, you know, I talked about Chris and Corey being really incredible at shallow fish, but, you know, up until when those buggers were just kids, I, you know, I could do that as good as anybody. I felt like sight fishing was, was one of my strengths, but now, you know, as, as time goes on, I mean, I can still see fish. I mean, I need uh, reading glasses, mm -hmm. you know, good old Costco specials to uh -huh. read even when I'm looking, you know, on uh, emails and stuff, but I also can see fish good without glasses. It's easy to sure. for me to see them in that. Um, but I probably give up on some fish a little quicker now than I used to. I used to be a little more tenacious at at staying with you know fish I can see and trying to catch them. But but you know, as we talked about earlier, as these fish get more educated. And, you know, like, I know you fish down Lake St. Francis some. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And those smallmouth there, that's like one of the most incredible fisheries in, in the world for large or for smallmouth and largemouth, but deep and shallow. But some of those smallmouth in the shallow water could be some of the toughest mm. clear water, shallow smallmouth yeah. I've ever seen to catch anywhere in North America. True. And I believe that's fishing pressure has done that. Um, it's good to see they're still there from a, you know, from a uh, fisheries management standpoint. Hey, it's, sure. it's wonderful. It's still a healthy fishery, but they are some of the, either the most stubborn mm. or smartest. I'm not sure which fish yeah. I've ever seen. Sure. Um, I, I love trying to catch them, but in tournaments, it, you know, this year we fished a, a tournament down there and we did terrible. We had a small limit and we were on the winning fish. Now, granted, some other boats were in the area that were also fishing them. So it made it tricky, but those fish just weren't biting for us. And, uh, but you know, you know, you're, you, you know, at least you were in the right area when the first place you stop and it's foggy. And we stop on this flat, and it's where we won a, a renegade tournament, my son and I, uh, uh, maybe about eight years ago or nine years ago, where we had just under 25 pounds, and and uh, we had those fish by like 1040 in the morning, so it was, a, it was a pretty neat day. And it was at that time, it was the largest limit of five fish had weighed in in a renegade uh -huh. in 20-year sure. history. So we're back in that spot this summer, and... And I, I knew there was a six near this one boulder. It was an August tournament. And I knew there was an over six. And then I saw some fours and fives in some areas, you know, within about 100, 125 yards around it. So we stop in there. Nobody's there. And it's kind of misty. And we're fishing. And I'll lock the poles down. And I'm just drifting with the current that's over some sand. And there's a little bit of weeds, a few solitary boulders. And it's like the perfect spot. Yeah, yeah. And. I'm throwing around, you know, a few baits where we saw the six, but you can't really see because it's early and it's misty. And we fish through it, nothing. We fish through, we see a couple fours further down, don't catch them. And a friend of mine, Scott Leckie, who lives in Cornwall, is a good largemouth, smallmouth angler, done very well locally there. Him and his partner pull up behind us, stop way before where the six is, and they slowly fish in. Then he puts his poles down. He'd obviously saw the same fish and pre-fish. He goes there, and then probably 15 minutes after he's pulled down, I hear them hooting and hollering about mm. 200 yards away. See him net it, and I talked to him after, and and he got the six something and a five something for 11 pat like Jeez, like, a, yeah. like 11 and a half pounds I think it was for yep. his first two fish. Yeah, and I already fished through the area. Wow, and, and you know. That's the part of fishing that I love and I hate. Mm -hmm. You know, you mm -hmm. you can be in the right area and you're fishing a little too. Um, you're not fishing loose. Uh, you're fishing a little uh, uptight. I think the fish almost can sense it, but certainly sure. the meat knows it. You know, yeah. you're probably fishing faster than you should, even mm -hmm. if it's a mad rig or a wacky uh, a stick bait or something. You're probably fishing too fast, and in that case. I feel like I should have pulled down and just thoroughly peppered that area yeah. with three or four things because that fish was still there, but I didn't know if it was, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't sunny and clear like the day before when I saw it. But, um, you know, you live and learn. I mean, every tournament I fish, whether I do crappy or, or bad, I'd say one out of about 10, I leave my mind spinning because I say, I don't know what I did right, wrong, what right. I, what yep. I did wrong but we didn't do good but mm -hmm. i'd say nine out of ten because i'll stay and i'll talk to the guys that do well who are you know usually guys i know and mm -hmm. i'll shoot breeze with them and and i'll listen to them on way in and stuff because i want to hear why they beat us you know sure. I want yeah yeah and and that's why you know you doing this podcast you can glean information and and you know you're out there fishing all the time but it's always neat to hear somebody else's story because you know their approach or technique might be slightly different than yours mm -hmm. or, or maybe their patience was more or even less. I don't know. Maybe they fish more spots or something. It, it so many factors, but I, I love the fact that you're always learning. Right. Mm, yeah, and uh, yeah. sometimes drives my son crazy and stuff because he wants to get going or, or, <laughs> right. or whatever. one of my tournament partners, if it's team tournament, but I always make a point of trying to stick around just to see, you know, and, sure. Uh, 
And even Gussie, you know, after that big win, I picked his brain dry just to find out what he was doing. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's like, okay, what jig were you using? Gussie goes, oh, the, the one that Brian Gustafson makes at Lake of the Woods Outfitters, you sure. know. Yeah. And you know, I had, even though the jig probably didn't matter as much as the presentation and the bait, mm -hmm. I still wanted to know what jig because yeah. those jigs are pretty key. And I got a bunch of them out in the garage, so I'm sure. already sad. But I just sure. had to make sure, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, so, you know, versatility, uh, you know, being, being versatile sounds like a strength, a uh, couple quick questions here before we end this podcast, a lot of great information. First of all, uh, Bob, man, we could talk for hours here. Um, obviously, uh, the passion for, for fishing really shines through with you. It, I want to know, like, what is your favorite way to catch smallmouth? Like describe the perfect day for you conditions, what you're doing, maybe what technique, uh, you know, what gets you like, like, this is, this is awesome. I could do this all, all day long. Absolutely. The perfect condition would be pretty well, most areas around the Great Lakes where you've got, you, you know, a population of deep ones and shallow ones. Mm -hmm. I would, if I had to pick a perfect day, it's flat, calm, sunny, and the fish have come up. Like not, you know, I'm not talking all the fish all of a sudden appear, but whatever those shallow fish, wherever they come from, appear. Mm -hmm, Even though sure. somebody else might be doing equally as well, or even better catching the same length of fish, they might be slightly fatter ones out deep, you know. But but let's say I'm on Erie or Lake Ontario or Simcoe or Georgian Bay or mm -hmm. Virgin mm -hmm. Bay or something. And all of a sudden it's magic. And those fish are shallow and they're eaten. And I remember some of the days I've had out there practicing before on like St. Clair and, and different, different areas all over where it absolutely is the most incredible bite you would ever see. I, I don't know. And you might be able to answer this because I've only the, the longest stretch I ever did back to back was 22 days on Lake Ontario and the thousand on the thousand islands when I was doing the coast of the Thousand Islands Open and um, and uh, the Canadian Open. Mm -hmm. They were back-to-back -back tournaments there uh, about, I don't know, maybe four years ago or so. And so I spent 22 days there fishing straight. I missed mm -hmm. a day. Yeah. Those days I'd fish till dark if I was by myself practicing. And, and uh, you know, others were tournament days. Not. So what I, what I found is that it was like, about one out of four to one out of seven and everything in between days, the fish would go nuts. And then mm. the other days you had to work for them, even mm -hmm. though they were still in the deep areas and some of the shallow areas. But in some of the, the situations, like I remember being out at uh, uh, Main Duck Island one day practicing by myself, and it was every drop and you could move and further and further and further and it was like there must have been thousands of fish there sure but they weren't big the last fish i caught was like a four and a half but everything else was like three and under like an incredible amount of two two and a half like to the point of craziness like i mm -hmm. got five or six in a row and then i moved the boat another 30 40 yards five or six in a row and they're all you know nothing you can win a tournament on and then finally get one over four I go and I start out there in the tournament. And I said to my co-angler in this Costa tournament or Everstart, whatever it was, I said to him, we we're out of Clayton. I said, listen, we're going to have a limit so quick. It'll make your head spin. Mm -hmm. All right. Never said that since because those fish weren't oh, there. Yeah. They moved. I don't know where they moved. And, and, you know, there were some other boats in the area fishing and, you know, this boat got one, and then 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes later, that boat got one. I, I literally, I think I left there with one keeper, and it was a dink, you know. Mm -hmm. Left and decided to do something else after, like, two hours of one fish. And But then the other days, on those magical days, I'd love to fish shallow. Sure. Go shallow, and the fish are just eating everything. You could throw a spy bait. You could throw a tube, a hair jig, a Ned rig. And they're just eating anything you want to do. And I remember at St. Clair once, and I get in um, off one of the big rivers there up in the northeast corner, and it's the day before the tournament. And I'm I'm shooting some video earlier that day. I shot a segment for the TV show, and uh, my camera girl at the time uh, was with me that day because 
Um, she just said, you know, I might as well just stay out with you rather than you take me all the way back to the ramp. So I went into one area and I went around this break in the sand on a spinner bait. And it was the most incredible spinner bait I've seen in mm -hmm. my life. I know I could have put 100 to 200 fish in the boat in very short order. And I know that sounds crazy, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. When you get into those magical deals, every fish that would thump me would have five to 10 fish fall on. Then I'd move down the sand break um, about 40, 50 yards. Then I'd throw another cast spinner bait, whack, I'd get one. And there'd be a, another herd of fish behind it. And I did this and I had GPS spots of about 15 GPS spots around this big hook in the, uh, the, the, the break. And I'm telling you, they were all good fish and they were eating that spinner bait as fast as you wanted to, to wind it. And I was so excited. That was the day before uh, one of the Canadian Opens there. And um, tournament rolls around. Big West Wind came. Mm. Buddies, I go there first yep. thing in the morning. I don't catch a fish. Not wow. one. Gone. They disappeared. Gone. And, and so, you know, but, but had I fished that day, it would have been, I know it would have been the best. And I'm going back, like, I remember fishing spinnerbaits in the Thousand Islands back in the 80s when mm -hmm. you know, they, they didn't know what a white spinnerbait was and they'd eat it like you wouldn't believe. And we'd have, you know, 100, 150 fish days all the time down in Thousand Islands on spinnerbait going into some of the big bays and stuff. This was better than that. This had mm. more fish per bite. There was a, 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 you know, school around every fish you hawked and they were all big. All right, I got to ask, what was a spinnerbait? What was that? What was a spinnerbait? Oh, a double willow leaf. Uh, you know, I usually use one gold, one silver, okay, uh, half ounce. But now I've switched to almost all three quarter ounce because I feel that for smallmouth, it's an advantage to have uh, a little heavier spinnerbait. I don't think it affects any of the fish catches, but it gives me a longer cast, mm -hmm. you know. So, so sure. if I'm using, you know, 17 pound fluorocarbon, I get a longer cast with a three quarter and, uh, and I still get, you know, the odd good spinner bait day, on, you know, fishing mm -hmm. shallow on Lake Erie and some of the places, the odd time Lake Ontario and Simcoe, but in on Georgian Bay, but that day was magical, but I've had those other types of days too, where you throw finesse baits and you're reeling it in as fast as you can, because you don't want to hook a fish before the tournament. Mm. You know, you're getting four, five, the occasional six, follow right to the boat right to the side mm -hmm. of the boat in like six or eight feet of water and it's chasing it and it doesn't care it wants that bait and you go you know how often does that happen in the mm. tour i know right like and, and i i'm not saying fish know any better but but what do you think it is do you think it's about one every four five six seven days where those fish do turn on it's like their last meal they want to eat. And then the other days it's just, you got to work at it. Right. I, yeah, I think so. I think there's also different. Uh, I think you can find that bite anywhere on the lake at any given time mm -hmm. too. I think it's areas and in the you're, conditions. You're right, because how many times does it happen where you go to a spot, you get a big limit and it happens quick. Mm -hmm. And it's like that school of fish, or that little area with the boulders or whatever, you know, it might be 30 feet down, but it's like bang, bang, bang. And it might be three foot waves out there and it's on. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then the shallow fish that same day might be completely off. Right. Oh yeah. 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 That's part of the challenge. Um, man. All right. We got to wrap this up. I, I know the viewers and, and listeners are, uh, are loving this conversation right now. So I got to ask you two quick questions here. Uh, number one, I want to know, Bob, what's your largest personal best smallmouth is? Yeah. Give me a little story behind that. Well, it's funny. I've caught like four, five, six, fifteens, so I've uh. never caught seven smallmouth. And all my buddies here in Ontario laugh that I have not caught a. Seven. I know. I was gonna say you had a, you. You don't have a seven pounder. No, and the irony is, is I'm gonna say all but one friend that is in southwestern southern ontario let's say um you know i'm not gonna count the guys way up northwest ontario because that's a thousand miles away so let's just count the guys down here you know around you know ontario lake ontario lake erie st Clair. i would say that uh if i took uh 10 hardcore smallmouth anglers that i know that live within 
three hours of me. Mm-hmm. Nine of them, well, with me included, eight of them, uh, uh, not me, I'll be in the two, uh, 2% two here or 20%, whatever. I've never caught one. I know one guy on Lake Erie that him and his wife have won probably more tournaments as a couple than any other man oh, wife on Erie. Sure. He's not broke seven, but his wife broke seven several times. Sure. Yeah. Um, you got you got uh, John White, Dave Chong, uh, Stroob, uh, uh, all kinds of people I know that have broke seven pounds. Yeah. Everybody I know almost the fish is hard. I think David has an eight. To his name. Oh yeah, and Stroob <laughs> got an eight too, and that, sure. and it's it, it's really funny. And, uh, and so I always tell them, oh, that's just luck catching those big ones. But I know one thing, they're all very good anglers. They pay their dues. Mm -hmm. They're out there a lot. And, and, you know, I've actually, when I've sight fish prior to tournaments, I think there's been one or two that I didn't try to hook that might've been in that seven range, but I uh -huh. don't want to look at me. Sure. Right. And, and, uh, and you know how many six plusers have been caught by my co-anglers? <laughs> right. Those? I drew one guy yeah. from Pittsburgh, the last coast I fished, and I did crappy in that tournament. I think I had 16 pounds the first day, and he had over 20, and he had like a six and a five mm -hmm. in his box. And he caught, I think he caught those shallow um, with me. I think he might have caught the one, the five deep and the six shallow, but but I was laughing. I said, man, I wish this was a team tournament because you and I yeah. would have a great way. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I had one he could have used or two, and I he had three I wanted badly. Yeah. But but you know even he had a six. Then I, I remember drawing this one guy in uh, in one of those tournaments in the coast, another one, and I hook a six deep just off Cape Vincent, and and uh, it's a good one. And I said, and he's a young college angler, really nice kid. And I said, I'm going to tell you all day if I hook a fish, just make sure your drop shot's down there the whole time. And it was like mm -hmm. three. Waves, waves. It was blowing hard. Yeah. So we're drifting, drifting. I'm fighting this big fish, and I, I said, make sure your bait's down there. Don't worry about the net till I get it close to the boat. But make sure your bait's there. So he, finally, I get the boat near the or the fish near the boat. He's about to dip this real fat six. Yeah. And he's got his rod down the side, and all of a sudden his rod bends, and he nets mine. He grabs his rod, and he gets a big, long, skinny six. Oh, jeez. And, and I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, it must have been following mine the whole time we were uh -huh. drifting. Right, sure. and uh, and I don't know how many times that's happened where where I've had sixes caught by co's, but the irony is I can't crack seven, and so hmm. six fifteen it is. So that's well, you it. know what? It's uh in most parts of the country. I well, actually, I don't care where you are. A five pounders, a pretty big smallmouth for for most people. Sixes yeah. are huge. You know, it's there a six pound fish is a a, a trophy smallmouth. Um, it's hard to get a seven. You know, it, it, well, it is. How about yourself? I'm eight even, Sturgeon Bay. Eight even. Oh, the Sturgeon Bay. Yeah. Little Sturgeon? Riley's. Riley's. Ah, yeah. Yes. It, Riley can be hit and miss, but I sure. love that. I love that bay. Yep. Yeah. Riley's, uh, we pulled in there one tournament and it was boom, boom, boom in the last 15 minutes coming in the way. And that mm -hmm. saved her bacon one day. Yeah. And, Stroob caught like I think a couple of fives and something, but it's it's funny how every year Sturgeon Bay changes, right? Mm, that's true. Never has there been in the over decade or more that we fished it. Two years have been alike, and and every sure. year we think like in this year where the borders still closed for us, we may not be going. I'm probably doubting we'll go yeah. in because of it. And I talked to Derek Stroob the other day, and he said. I bet you they'll be on beds this year for the because he knows uh, I'm on bed fishing. Sure, sure. I bet you they'll be on beds this year. And I said, who knows? I said because you know we got that deep freeze there for a while mm -hmm. this winter, but then it's it was mild and and you know uh, um, before it, all January is mild and so it didn't have as much ice as other years. I don't think. And every year we're watching the radar, right? That that satellite imagery. Mm -hmm. and, we're watching every year, all winter. We're watching to see when the bay opens up. Sure, yeah. I, oh, wonder what the fish are going to be doing, you know. Yep. And, uh, yep. So at eight there, so um, I forget that guy that works for Normark, uh, Mark Fisher. Mark Fisher. Okay. Two eights that mm -hmm. one year, one in practice and one in the tournament. I think. Mm -hmm. I think, if I'm not mistaken, were they sevens or eights? Might have been sevens. No, they were eights. I think. Eights. He yeah. Patterned them. He actually told me and Stroob, he says, 
we he patterned those fish. He got them on the same pattern, different days, different spots. And I'm like, how do you pattern eight pounds? <laughs> <laughs> there's there's definitely some big fish up there all right last question bob if if i could uh let's just say for the rest of the year you i'm gonna give you one bait you can use to catch smallmouth and that's it what bait's that gonna be oh boy i'm gonna have to pick drop shot rig and and uh it, it'd be might be you know the good old Ah, worm, but okay. I might go against the grain and go with a, a gulp fry, a uh, yeah. uh, you know, green pumpkin gulp fry. But I like the fry more for deep water, and I like the you know, that that flat worm kind of works both, both yeah. they're hard to come by right now. I mean, that I was know shortages, but I, I probably see then the Ned rig comes into play. I know we well, got to choose one bait. What's it gonna okay. be? It's gonna be a flat worm. It Green is. Pumpkin, drop shot. That way, at least I can adjust the leader. Okay, the there you go. I, I can't go. adjust. I can't adjust anything else. All right, let's go one step further. Color. Uh, it'd have to be just go with a green pumpkin. Green pumpkin. Yeah, it's yeah. it's about as uh, versatile as they come. It is. And, it and I, is. I mean, I like I like this one here. Is is uh, that uh, yep. brown laminate with sort of a light side to it? Yes. That's a good color too, and then I like a lot of the black. I I use sure. a lot of the black flatworm, and and yeah. and I like green pumpkin candy. You know, with the mm -hmm. that's one of my favorites. But but I think I'd have to go green pumpkin if I only pick one. You know, fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, yeah. Don't ever <laughs> limit me like that, though. Okay. No, how no. Would ever, how would we ever fill in the other days of just? I buying know. Them? I know. I I like to ask that with everyone because it's it's interesting the the different you know uh everyone's kind of different but very similar so you're going to have either you know some t sort of drop shot or a stick bait or a tube or a swim bait that's you know nobody's ever said oh a spinner bait you know what i mean everyone's always said tube swim bait or something like like your drop shot bait and you know you could probably rig that on that head and do just as fine too if you had to yeah, the, there's so many tools of the trade that you know as a smallmouth uh, uh, angler that that work, and they all have their time and place. And uh, you know, when you ask a question like that, the first thing goes through my mind is, okay, I'm thinking of when they're biting good and when they're biting poor. Mm. What's a bait that at least I know is going to be on one of my rods and on the deck all the time, and it's probably a drop shot. But but. Uh, one thing I will say, drop shot has stood the test of time. And and I saw uh, the podcast you did uh, with Kyle from Sturgeon Bay area. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, he mentioned that he doesn't use a drop shot that much. Right. And I'm like, wow, you know, and, and you know. He's, he's not the only one. I've had a handful of other guys on this uh, podcast that you, you'd be surprised. These are like big name guys that you would think. They're like, yeah, I don't, I don't throw a drop shot as much as you would think. Yeah, it's well, you know, I mean, to each his own. It's just that I've seen time and time again when it's flat calm and you got a bite going out and, you know, 25, 30, 35, 40, even 50 feet of water. And the only thing that catches them is holding a drop shot there and hardly moving it, mm -hmm. you know. And all of a sudden, you know, you go to lift it and there's a bit of dead weight. And you go, is it stuck in a rock or a zebra mm -hmm. muscle? And you lift and lift it more. And then you just lift it and sat. And, you know, you got a big fish on and you go, that fish didn't even hit it. It just sucked wow. it in. That's um, my favorite part, man. Right so, there. You just said, that's it. Yeah. It doesn't get any better than that. It, lift and lift it. And then all of a sudden, yeah. you look real good. <laughs> and <it's> like, oh. <laughs> exactly. Man. All right, Bob, really good stuff. I, I certainly, uh, I want to appreciate, you know, take the time to, to come in on this show. This is uh, a lot of good information, a lot of great stories. Again, I know we could go on and on. If people want to learn a little bit more about yourself as far as following you on social media and your shows and everything you're doing, uh, what's the best way that they can do that? Yeah, we, we're on, uh, you know, Twitter, Instagram, and uh, and Facebook. I, I don't do as much social as I should, but I've uh -huh. got all my sponsors are saying you got to do more, but uh, yeah. I, I like being on the water. That's my problem. Right. 
And, uh, um, you know, uh, bobazumi.com uh, uh, or at bobazumi on most of them or real fishing, uh, the real fishing show. And, uh, you know, Travis, I just want to say thank you for having me on your podcast. I, I know you're a hardcore angler uh, and uh, you love what you do. And, and I commend you for being a guide. I know how much work it is. And, uh, and uh, you know, you got to, one thing about guiding strangers, when you're out with clients that you haven't guided before, not only do you have to put them on fish and, and hope that their mechanical skills are good, but you also have to be mentally put them in the right frame of mind. Sure. You got to entertain them for the day. Exactly. So, yeah. What it's all about, man. It's a it's a it's a full time job, uh, both both between the ears and, and mentally, physically, the whole match. And and I uh, I commend you for it. that's uh, that's cool because I know how much hard work it is. So. I just love being on the water, just like you. I mean, that's what uh, that's what we all strive for. I don't know. I can't think of anything else I'd rather do than than be on the water. So no, either can I, I, uh, it's, it's to the point of, uh, it's a little bit of a sickness, but it's a <laughs> True. Sickness. much better than COVID. Right. So yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> awesome. All right, Bob. Well, thank you so much. And you're always welcome back. And as always, until next time, we'll see you guys on the water. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on Instagram at Small Mouth Crush. Also, the YouTube channel, Small Mouth Crush. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a